Amen. Amen. See what happened? <laughs> you know, Father Jimmy is a friend of the Holy Spirit. And something uh, that St. Bonaventure said about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit comes where he is loved, where he is invited, and where he is expected. Father, we love you. <laughs> we invited you, and I was expecting you, so thanks for coming back. <laughs> I didn't know Father Eddie could sing so good, did you? <laughs> I know it's Lent, but this is a parish mission, so I have special faculties for a parish mission. I'm going to say, Alleluia. Remember, Augustine said, we're an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. Amen. So we should be happy um, every day of our lives because we're heaven-bound. We're heaven-bound. That's our destiny. It's our origin and our destiny. And God wants you and me there more than we want to go there. Isn't that funny? He wants us more than we want him. Isn't that crazy? But we are heaven-bound. There was a rap song. I'm not a good rapper, but I remember the rapper that said, <laughs> heaven-bound. We need to be heaven bound. So you try it right now, all right? Say this after me. Say, he, 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 heaven bound. I dub you official Christian rappers. <laughs> so we're on our way to heaven, and we have the bread of heaven. Amen? Amen. And so I, the Lord told me to share with you another story about the Eucharist, a miracle story. And gosh, just seeing it, I start to get the Holy Spirit tingles just talking about it. I need to share with you something about this precious gift we have because when the victory comes, the whole world will be not only Catholic, but Eucharistic. The whole world will be Eucharistic. And what breaks my heart as a priest is that we have been ignoring the greatness of God in the sacrament, including many clergy. We don't seem to understand what's really at stake here. And I think God the Father in his justice is about to send thunderbolts across the world. I do. A great, a great shakeup is coming. And after that shakeup, those who land on their feet, it's probably those who pray the rosary, those who land on their feet will become true Catholics, men and women who are saintly in love with God. And the Lord said new miracles will occur, some we've never even heard of before, new miracles. And even teenagers will have miracles and work miracles in the age that is coming. Amen? Something fabulous is coming, beloved. I'm just getting that anointing all over me. And the Lord says to share that with you. These are, these are true prophecies. Not only have I heard them, but they come from the saints as well. Canonized saints have said these things. If you want a good book about some of these things, uh, Christine Watkins' book, The Warning, I would recommend to you. The Warning by Christine. It just came out, a revised edition. And uh, Professor Daniel O'Connor, a wonderful professor, he has a beautiful book too, about the divine will. And his book's called The Crown of Sanctity. It's really worth reading with all the prophecies there. So before I continue with this story, we're gonna pray the unity prayer. This is an end times gift to the Catholic Church, to the whole world. And you should have this. It's also, I believe, on your printout. So if you don't have the holy card, I know we passed it out yesterday, but if you don't have the holy card, don't despair. It should be on your handout as well. So it's halfway down your paper handout to the same prayer. And I want to recommend to you, Father Ed and I spoke about this and the team earlier, that you take a picture on your cell phone of this prayer. Take a picture. I want to do something special here. Uh, this prayer, I witnessed to this earlier in the week. It's simply nothing less than miraculous, this prayer. I use it as an exorcist, and now all the exorcists of the world are starting to use this prayer because of what happened. But it's not only for us, it's for every Catholic, for every baptized person. It literally blinds and paralyzes every single demon in the area. Amen? Amen. And the Lord is so good because it looks like hell has been opened. And like all the demons are flying around right now, 
And this will protect you and your family when you say this prayer daily. And I always recommend to say it twice to pray for your city. See, the church teaches us, it's in the Summa Theologia of Thomas Aquinas, that part of piety is loving your homeland. We should never tear down our country. Amen? Amen. That's actually evil. If you're from Hungary, you love and support Hungary. If you're from Poland, you love and support Poland. If you're from Nigeria, you love and support Nigeria. And if you're from this country, you love and support this country. Amen? Amen. Oh, it was not perfect. Well, tell me, are you perfect? There's nothing perfect on the earth. Amen? Amen. That's the whole idea. Because she's not perfect, you protect her. Amen? Amen? And if your country has a flaw, maybe you were born to heal the flaw. Maybe that's why you're here, not to complain about it, but to heal it. Amen. Amen. So all this nonsense, and even in our universities, our kids are being taught, it's all an error, it's sinful, and it's evil. Amen? Amen. We should love this country and support this country. If you see a flaw, you work on it to heal it. Amen? Amen? You don't complain about it and burn down buildings because of it. You don't do that. You get down on your knees and you pray for your country. Amen? Amen. This is called piety. Of course it's from God. He didn't put us here to hurt one another. He put us here to heal one another. Amen? Amen. So this holy prayer we're going to do right now, we're going to do it twice. The second time will be for Seattle. Oh, I just got the anointing. Because we want to blind any demonic spirits over Seattle. Uh, the Lord says, I can tell you this. The Lord showed me there's a stronghold in every state or city. There's like a leading demon in every state or city. So as I was praying for Seattle today, the Lord showed it to me. The more time you spend in prayer, not just priests, you too, the more time we spend in prayer, the more that revelation will come to you from the Holy Spirit. It's really more a question of time. As the bumper sticker says, just do it. Just pray, and the revelation will come. Amen? Amen? But we need more than three minutes a day. Three minutes is fine if you're two and a half years old. <laughs> it's fine. But for every adult, like everyone 18 years of age or over, one year is the bare, excuse me, one hour a day is the bare minimum. <laughs> one hour a day. Two hours a day is better today. We're in the battle of our life. This is the battle. Isn't it fun? I love it. I don't want to be a wussy. I'm in a battle. How about you? I, I, I like the battle, but I want to win. Amen? Amen? And so an hour a day really isn't enough anymore. That was good when Leave it to Beaver was popular. Right? That was good back then. Now we need two hours a day minimum. Amen? I sometimes tell people that it's just like your rosaries. One used to be enough, right, when Leave it to Beaver, the Beverly Hillbillies was on. But now we have Harry Potter and God knows things even worse than that now. We need two, three, and four rosaries a day. All of us do. The battle is about to get intense. Amen? You know that, don't you? Because we've thrown out the Ten Commandments. We've thrown out Jesus. And we've thrown out common sense. Amen? But here's what I learned about the rosary and also about the holy hour. If you do one holy hour or you do one holy rosary a day, that's good because it keeps you from drowning. We call that treading water. So if you, if you do one rosary a day, you're basically treading water. That's good. You're keeping yourself from drowning in misery, despair, and sin, right? So one is pretty good. But if you do two rosaries a day or two holy hours, Instead of treading water, you start to swim. You actually make progress. When you do two rosaries or two holy hours, you start to make progress, and you're moving a little bit. You're growing in the spiritual life. That's pretty cool. Amen? If you do three rosaries a day or three holy hours, you start swimming like an Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> you make real progress when you do three a day. And if, perchance, you do four a day, you stop swimming, you get on top of the water. You start walking on top of the water. When you pray four verses a day, you start walking on top of the water. 
you start becoming like Jesus. Amen? So I'm going to give him the key if you can. This is the time to learn to walk on water. Amen? Hallelujah? Now, don't be afraid of that. It's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. So keep that in mind. And before every holy hour or before every rosary, I want to recommend to you the Holy Unity Prayer, also on your paper. And don't worry, if you don't have it in your hands, I'm going to say it out loud. And you can say it after me, beloved, line by line. I love this prayer. You know, I met with Peter Cardinal Erdo twice the last two weeks. That's the wonderful bishop who gave the imprimatur. It's completely approved. And he's a very, he's an intelligent man with a PhD, very conservative, very calm. He's very careful. They took more than 10 years to approve this. It's utterly vetted and approved. It is the weapon, and Satan's getting angry at me right now. I have a special grace to see demons and angels. And right now, I can see his irritation. He's getting more and more angry at me right now because I'm about to give you the winning factor. Amen? Amen? So let's say it right now to blind him and paralyze him from seeing this assembly right now, including the healing service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved, would you say this after me line by line? My adorable Jesus, May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Now, something just happened. Can you feel what I'm seeing? Can anybody feel or see what I'm seeing? A light just came over you. A heavenly light just came over the church. In the dark, I saw some demons there earlier. They're gone right now. That, I don't know if you can feel it. It's actually very visible to me. A light just came over you. This has an absolute imprimatur, and so does the promise have an imprimatur, too. In other words, what's promised to is guaranteed by the church. So this is, beloved, this to me is a lifesaver. We have to have this now. As Pope John Paul said, we are involved right now in the greatest battle between light and darkness since the fall of Adam and Eve. That's what John Paul said. This is the battle that we're in. It's kind of fun, isn't it? But when you go into the battle, you've got to have a, you have to have a shield, right? A defense. It's okay to be in the battle as long as you have a defensive measure. This is your defensive measure. Amen? Amen. Now, can we do it one more time for Seattle? I saw over Seattle a giant serpent today, and it was the biggest one I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of them. You know, in my work, I've had people possess, true story, big church like this, slithering like a snake, the man and the woman all the way through the church, slithering like a snake. Because the devil manifested himself first as a serpent. Amen? So, I saw the biggest one I've ever seen in my life coiled in the sky over Seattle. And the Lord tells me it's because of witchcraft in the New Age movement. That's what he told me. It's because of witchcraft in the New Age movement. Those things aren't cute. They're not cute, and they're not fun, and they're not funny. Even the New Age movement is a calling upon evil spirits. You know that, don't you? So calling upon the evil one. There's only one name given to the human race by which Seattle can be saved. And what is that name? Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's the only name that can save us because that name is divine. That person is divine. And he's right here next to me. He's right here, Jesus. And we love him. Amen? Amen. He says to tell you, don't worry, I will manifest myself to you. He's speaking to me right now. And that's a biblical promise, right? It's a biblical promise. 
He will come. If any man calls upon me, I will come to him with my father and sup with him. Jesus will be manifesting himself in Seattle right in your living rooms. Some of you will see him with your eyes. Amen? Amen. But I think we have a responsibility or just out of justice or charity to pray for Seattle. You must love Seattle, no? I mean, we love our hometowns. I'm from Tampa. We love them. Even if they're naughty, we still love them. We want to make that serpent disappear. Amen? Amen. And that way, the people of Seattle, including those who have no religion, no baptism, they'll stop being influenced by the enemy. You see, that's the whole idea. Stop being influenced by him. When the great warning comes, which will come as a result of the second prayer, the great warning, the illumination of conscience, he'll be bound from the face of the earth for six weeks. No demons at all for six weeks. So that everyone can choose the right path. But for now, we use the bigger prayer to bind him in our area. So let's bind him now. Are you ready? This is for all of Seattle right now. A demon just started screaming. That's why he paused for a moment and began to scream. That big old serpent. You see, he knows what's coming. So let's say it now to bind him from Seattle. Try to do it every day. Once for yourself, once for Seattle. And if you can, do it multiple times during the day, like morning, noon, afternoon, and nighttime. That's best. A second time right now, that demon is getting really upset, and we're going to say it right now. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together. To gain mercy from the eternal Father. Father. Amen. Amen. So, beloved, would you raise your right hand towards Christ Jesus in the tabernacle? Could you raise your right hand towards the Lord? And would you say this after me? My beautiful Jesus, Jesus. we adore you. We We need you. We We love you. Manifest yourself to me. Manifest yourself to my family. And manifest yourself to Seattle. Lord, banish all darkness from my city. Bring the true faith to everyone in Seattle. Bring nothing less than eternal salvation. We love you, Jesus. We We are all yours. yours. And all that we have is yours. yours. Through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mary. Amen. Amen. May God seal you in that consecration that you will always love him and forever. Amen. Amen. And I'm claiming you for heaven just so you know I have a deal with God. He's my boss, but he's also my best friend. I have a deal I made with him years ago. It's very real. That's why I get sick a lot. I had lots of fever today for you. I made a deal with him that every mass and every conference I give, that those who come will be eternally saved. I made a deal. And I gave him my life. He's free to kill me whenever he wants to, to take my life. I've nearly died. I've had pneumonia 34 times, which is like a record. For you. I said, take my life, but save my people. Amen? Amen. So I hope you want to go to heaven because you're heaven bound. (laughs) I've already claimed you. Amen? Amen. You do the same thing when you get home, claim your family. Okay, you do what I do for your family. This is the only way. He sacrificed his life, and I join my sacrifice to his 
to bring it to my family. You see? It works together. He, he was the first one, and then we follow him. Amen? <laughs> and, beloved, here's a true story from World Youth Day in Australia. I, I took my group down there, my young people. I had a youth group in Central America, in Belize, near next to Honduras and Guatemala. So it's a beautiful little country. I brought my youth group there. And it was quite an undertaking, of course, to bring 40 teenagers from a third world country to Australia, because we had nothing, you see. We had fundraisers every week for two and a half years. And somehow we raised the money. I still don't know how we did it. God somehow was with us and all of that. So 40 of us went from Central America to Australia for World Youth Day. And while we were there, it's in July, of course, every summer. But you know, in Australia, July is winter. It's not summer like it is in Florida where I was born, like it is in Central America. So we kind of knew that, but they promised us when we got there, July is like the snow on the ground in July. They promised us that they would have cots, because we're, we're staying in Catholic high schools across the country, across Australia. They have caught, get us off the ground. When we got there, there were no more cots. So my group, we were in two giant classrooms in the basement of a Catholic high school. All the boys were with me and my, my men in one side, and all the girls were with my nuns and other holy mothers there as the you know, chaperones, and we had to sleep on the floor. So the floor was, of course, right next to the ground, underneath ground level. It was below freezing. It was really cold and I got pneumonia. And boy, I got it really bad. And so we were walking home from the event with Pope Benedict. We were walking home, and it just grew all over my lungs within an hour or two. And I could barely breathe by the time we got back to our high school. And I told my, the kids who were with me, I had like six or seven kids, you know, we gotta find that first aid station they have for us. And so they walked me there because I could barely breathe. We got there and I was gargling. It was that serious. So we have insurance, of course. Being in World Youth Day, you have a little bit of insurance all of us take out to be there. And they brought me to this first aid clinic, an emergency clinic in Australia. It was quite, you know, it was first world country. It was really advanced. And we went there and they, they really took good care of me, put these wires in me and tried to get me to breathe. And by this time, I'm dying. And I can't talk. It's, I'm gargling. When I try to speak, you actually hear a gargle. I couldn't say anything. The doctors gave me some shots. They gave me oxygen. They had these IVs going into me. And so there was this young Australian doctor and the representative for World Youth Day on either side of my stretcher. And I'm there. And they're about to lose a Catholic priest. As if, I, mean, I would have set a record that day, you see? The first priest to die, I think, at World Youth Day. And... <laughs> They, they were a little concerned. They didn't want that record. And so they were trying to take care of me, and it really wasn't working. And the doctor said, Father, I'm sorry. This is a beautiful young doctor. He just had just charity in him, and he was, you could see his face was in pain looking at me. And I was laying there, and I knew I was about to die, because I've had pneumonia so many times, you know it when you've had it. I've had it really bad a few times, and it was so bad, I felt my spirit begin to lift out of my body. It was that, that close to death. So, that's when I made my first deal with God. That's where I learned. I said, well, Lord, I'm about to die, and I'm your priest. It must be worth something for a young, faithful priest to die. It must be worth something. So I'm gonna make a deal with you, okay? I say that in my spirit. I would like to ask you, you give me the souls of all 500,000 teenagers who are present for Australia World Youth Day, and you take my life. I think it must be worth something, you see what I mean? That's a pretty good deal, don't you think? So I figure, well, I'll buy you on the table, but I'll get 500,000 teenagers into heaven. That's not too bad, is it? That was a pretty good deal. To me, it's a win-win situation. I'll go straight to heaven, and they'll be saved. So I made that deal with God, and I said, oh, oh, and one more thing. See, my dad was a lawyer, so I learned to negotiate. <laughs> I said, 
one more thing, um, take care of my mom. Because my mom was still living. And she was unutterably beautiful, my mother. Her name was Maria. And I had the best mother in the world. I'm sorry, yours was number two. <laughs> Just joking, we all had the best mother, didn't we? We all had the best mother. And I loved her to take care of my mom. And when I said that, to make my deal with our best friend, he's our father, our God, our spouse, our friend, our food, our oxygen, our everything is God. I gave it to him, take my life, I was dying anyway, give me the kids, I want their souls, that's all I want. Right then, beloved, how to explain this, I don't know. I could try to describe to you what happened, but something you call ecstasy in a mystical life, it started, of all things, in my feet, at my toes and my feet. This supernatural heavenly joy came down my feet to my legs, to my belly, to my chest. And this joy was so exquisite, it was so profound. And I said, take my life, but give me the kids, take it. The joy was overwhelming. It was, it was so profound and so powerful, I thought I couldn't bear it, like I was gonna die of an explosion of joy. It was an unbearable joy, you ever heard that before? Absolutely unbearable. I was dying of joy. And these tears came out of my eyes, and I couldn't bear this joy. And the doctor and the world you take representative saw me crying. And they started to cry when they saw me crying. They thought I was crying like out of sadness. They thought I was crying because I was dying. And so the doctor and the reverend said, Oh, Father, they're crying. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. And I'm like in ecstasy. <laughs> oh, we're so sorry. I, it was the funniest thing in the world. They're dying of sadness, and I'm dying of joy. And they're, they're looking at me, and I, 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 so I tried to tell them, but I can't talk. So I did the best I could to say one word to try to alleviate their concern. So I could say one three-letter word. You know which one it was? Yes. I did my best, but I couldn't, but I tried. And went, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And they thought I was crazy. They didn't know what I was saying. I was trying to say joy, like, stop crying, I have joy. But I couldn't talk. They said, oh, they started crying even more. <laughs> it was the most amazing experience, maybe of my life. It was like heaven came into that clinic, heaven. Can you imagine when you and I enter the gates of heaven? It's absolutely real. Amen? Yeah. It's, oh, baby, is it real? That's what's waiting for you and I. That's why we got to stop sinning tonight. Amen? No sin. It ain't, ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. You want what I felt that night. Amen? It was incredible. He gave me back my life. I don't know why. He gave it back to me the next morning. I should have died. The doctor said, this is impossible, he told me. I started getting better. I said, boy, that's quite a deal. I started to get better. And when I got better early in the morning, I said to the Lord, that's not fair. I made a deal with you. No, you, you can't give me back my life because I, I want those kids in heaven. You, you can't do this. I started to get upset. And then I realized like a flash of lightning. Oh. I get it. You're giving me your part of the bargain, and you give me back my life anyway. And he went like this to me. And you are too good. You are too beautiful. This is too much. This is who we serve. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, you, beloved, you don't want to miss the boat to heaven. Amen? Amen? It was absolutely beautiful. And here is another reason why, an illustration for you why you don't want to miss it. That's why we're Catholics. We're in the ark of salvation. When my dad was dying, shortly after that, my beautiful father, when my daddy was dying, my little brother and I, we now were priests, we said mass in the hospital room in the ICU. And he was, he was going home. 
He was um, pretty old, you know, close to 80 years old, with a big white beard. He looked like Socrates, my dad. He was a retired judge and a lawyer and an architect. He's an amazing man. He was almost at death's door within a day. And my brother and I, we went there to say mass in my, brother, in my daddy's hospital room in the ICU. So we took like a little hospital cart table, you know, those little rolling tables. We made a little tiny altar there and said mass. And my father could not receive the host. He couldn't eat anything. But he could receive a drop of the precious blood, you see? And so as a Catholic priest, I'm allowed to touch the blood with my finger. I'm allowed to do that. So, Holy Communion, I touch the chalice, the blood, and say, Dad, this is Jesus. I'm giving you Holy Communion. This is Jesus. And my dad opened his mouth, and I put the drop of blood on his tongue. And he tasted it, and he swallowed it. I mean, it's unbelievably touching, you know, and beautiful. Unbelievably touching and beautiful. And the promise that my master made, my master, you might know him, his name is Jesus Christ. What my master said was this, he's your master too, I pray. The man who eats my body and drinks my blood shall live forever. That's why even the Protestants and the Pentecostals need Holy Communion. Amen? And it's coming. They're going to come back to the Catholic Church soon. Soon. So I touched the blood on my daddy's tongue and he swallowed it. And the Bible verse is so clear to me. If you eat my body and drink my blood, you will live forever. So my beautiful papa passed away the next day, my daddy, fortified by the blood of the master. So fast forward 11 years. Now my mother is dying. And I come home from Central America to take care of my mom for a few weeks. And I ask God to give me a sign as my mother's dying some 11 years later. Because every year I would come home and anoint my mother and she'd get well again. It happened 20 years in a row. She was dying and I would anoint her with a sacrament of anointing, she'd get better. It happened 20 years in a row. When I would come in, the doctor said, oh no, and he would just leave. Because they lose all their profit. You see, she gets better when she leaves the hospital. And if I couldn't make it one year, I'd call my brother, Father Tony. He would go and anoint my mom. She'd still get better with the sacrament of anointing. So it's like the 20th year in a row. She's in her 80s. She's old and tired. And I told our best friend, I said, Lord, you don't need to keep my mother alive for me. I love her. But she's vastly better off in heaven. I'm sorry. We were made for heaven. You were not made for earth. You were not made for Seattle. Seattle was made for you. You were made for heaven. You were not made for the earth. The earth was made for you. You were made for heaven. Amen? That's our destiny. and That's where you want to go. You don't want to miss that boat. Amen? And so my mama, I know it's better in heaven. I know it's better there. And I said, Lord, don't keep her here for me. She's suffering. She's in pain. But Lord, I'm going to anoint her today. And when I do, you always heal her. Another year. You don't need to do that for me, I told him. So I need a little sign from you. I need to anoint her anyway, out of propriety to anoint her. Show me whether you're taking mama home or leaving her here for another year. Because if she's going to go home and I, I need to call my siblings. They're all over the country. And that, we can't afford to do that every year. We're a poor family to fly across the country. I only need to call them if they really have to come, you see, because we can't afford it. And so God, please give me a sign. My mom fell asleep. I went to the other room in the house. I had an altar set up and I said, Holy Mass for my mom. And I said, I said God, give her whatever she needs. Of course, show me what you're going to do. At the end of Holy Mass, I'm cleaning the chalice near the very end of Mass. There's only my mother in the house. She's sleeping in her bed in the bedroom on the other side of the hallway. And I'm on this side. There's nobody else in the house. I can hear my mother if she calls me. No one in the house 
and something moves to my left. But my mom is on the right in another room sleeping. There's no one in the house. Something moves over here, you know, your peripheral vision. And I turn. And again, beloved, I just can describe to you. I can't explain these things. This is the God of wonders. The Bible says, you are mighty God, prince of peace, God, hero, father forever. Amen? That's your Jesus. Do you know how great he is? He is the miracle worker. He's awesome beyond measure, and he's ready to move. Amen? And let him move in your house and your heart first. Amen? Miracles will start happening in Seattle beginning this week. Amen? And so, beloved, I can't tell you how this happened. I can just tell you what happened. Amen? Something moved, and I turned to my left. Absolutely true story. I can't defend it. I'm just going to tell you. I turned to my left, and in the air here, to the left of the altar, is a window floating in the air. I'm sorry. I don't know how to explain it. That's just what happened. I'm getting goosebumps right now. I turned to my, there's a, there's a window. It's circular. And as I'm looking at this window, floating in the air, it expands in front of me. It grows in front of me. It looks almost like a porthole on a ship, but it's getting bigger. And I didn't put it together till later, a porthole. Because my dad used to be a Navy officer, you see? I never put it together. So I see this window, and what would you do? You'd look through it, wouldn't you? Don't lie now. You'd look through it, right? I went like this. <laughs> and there I saw my dad in heaven. Can you it? I saw my dad. <sighs> and he's younger than me. And that's not fair. <laughs> He's like 30-something with black hair. He died like close to 80 with white hair and a beard. He's young and handsome. Of course he is. All my good looks come from there. <laughs> He's young and handsome. And my daddy, I haven't seen him in 11 years. The last time I saw my dad, I put the blood of the God-man on his tongue, the blood that has the promise, even in Seattle, that those who eat my body and drink my blood will live forever. That's the last time I saw my dad. He was dying, and I put the blood of the God-man on his tongue. The next time I see him, he's in heaven, young and alive forever. This is our Catholic faith. This is our promise. This is our reward. Amen. Amen. I saw my dad. Don't you dare tell me I didn't. I'm getting goosebumps everywhere. He was amazingly beautiful. Incredible. Younger than me. My hair was silver. His was black. I'm still upset about that. <laughs> he didn't have any glasses either. He didn't need glasses in heaven. When we get to heaven, your hair will turn black and your glasses will disappear. And even your pimples will disappear. <laughs> Thanks be to God. No more bad breath in heaven. No more dirty socks. Thank God for heaven. And my dad, just to tell you, I saw him, when I looked through, he, I saw his back. I looked in, there's my, the back of my dad. And I'm here looking at my dad through the window. And my dad is standing, I'm back there, like this. And he goes like this. And I'm, I'm here looking at this. My dad's a judge and a lawyer, he's not a conductor. <laughs> and my dad's going like this. But all of us are musicians in my family, all of us are. I played the trumpet, the harmonica, and the guitar. We all played instruments, we love music, and like, we're Italian, we love music. So it makes some sense that way, we were musicians. But you never was a conductor. And I'm seeing you go like this. So what would you do? I looked around his waist and under his legs. I really did. I want to see who was he conducting. 
because his back was right there. So I looked around, and then, oh, I'm just getting emotional now, and I apologize. I look around, and there's a set of pews like this that fan out about the almost exact same size and shape like this. There are like 75 people. In the first row are my grandparents. And they're alive. I mean, it's not like an image or a painting. And they're young. My grandparents were in the first row. And behind them, other relatives. And I didn't know most of them. The Lord said to me, those are your ancestors. He spoke to me. I'm getting very emotional. But those are your ancestors. Like my great-great-uncle, my great-great-great-great-grandfather, like that. Do you know that my, my father's direct ancestor, same name as my dad, William M. Blunt, signed the Constitution of the United States of America. A direct, my direct ancestor, same name as my dad. He was left-handed like my dad. His, his signature looks just like my dad's signature. So I, I bet he was one of those there, William and Bloom. I didn't know most of them. The Lord said, those are your ancestors. And my dad was going like this, and then he must have felt, my daddy must have felt my eyes penetrating his back. You know how that is? Suddenly, my dad turned like this. Hey, Jim. <laughs> he didn't even say Father Jim at all. He just said, Jim, no respect at all. You know what I mean? No respect. But he turned around and gave me the most beautiful smile I've ever seen, this side of paradise, this smile. And it wasn't a clown smile, like a big clown smile. It was a refined, refined smile. But on his smile, his face, I can see it right now. Like, no worry, no anxiety, no fear, no sin, no shame, no guilt. Pure and perfect refinement, peace, pleasure, and joy. It was like a, it was a perfect smile. It was incredible. It's only in heaven, those kind of smiles. But the more you receive Eucharist here, the more your smile becomes like his. Amen? And he smiled at me, my daddy. He turned, it was the most beautiful smile, and he said, hey, Jim, and I'm over here. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. My dad's like one foot away from me. I'm getting the Holy Spirit right now. And he said to me, my dad said this, we're getting ready for mom. We're getting ready for mom. And I had asked in the Mass that God gives me a sign whether to call my family to come because we're poor or to wait another year. My dad says to me after he smiles at me, he was happy. He wants to see his darling, you know what I mean? He says, we're getting ready for mom. He smiled. Then he turned back around and put his hands up like this. And then I got it. They were rehearsing the welcome song for my mom. They were rehearsing the welcome song for mom. When you and I pass, we're faithful to Jesus. When we eat his body and drink his blood faithfully, when you enter heaven, all your family will be there and they will sing a song like you've never heard before. They will welcome you. Hello, Louis, we love you. Welcome to heaven. We've been waiting for you. And they'll sing to you. <laughs> What's going on? That's what I get for not singing too pretty. And they will sing a song to you and I at that point, and then Mary will come with Michael and lead you and I to the throne room. Our family behind us have already sung. They will lead us to the throne room. And there we will put our hands on the lap of Jesus and Mary. We'll put our hands on their lap. And they will look at you and I in the eyes. I've seen their eyes, Jesus and Mary. And they will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the glory. 
of your Father. Amen. Alleluia. Let's say one Hail Mary. I'm very sincere about this, that no one here misses it. I've already made a deal with God, so you can't miss it. That everyone here will experience what I just described to you. That you will go to heaven because, beloved, you were made for heaven. You were not made for hell. You were not even made for this earth. This earth was made for you. You were made for heaven. Amen. A Hail Mary now that everyone here will make it. And even tonight, you will begin to taste the joy of heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Testing Ave Maria. <laughs> See, there's even angels on the earth sometimes. So, beloved, um, I don't want to go on uh, too much longer, but one more miracle story. Is that okay? Yeah. It won't take too long. I've been in the anointing, but the Lord says, You need to know this. I have found that the Eucharist is the greatest source of the Holy Spirit in the world today. And I heard, have you ever heard of the pastor Benny Hen? Wonderful Pentecostal minister. I, I love him. I think he's going to become Catholic. He's a great miracle worker for the Lord. I think he's a humble man, but God uses him in a wondrous way. There's a video clip, maybe you can find it on YouTube, where he said, he was telling the Pentecostals, he says, a recent survey, he's speaking now, Benny Hen said a recent survey was done. He was telling them, he says, do you realize, brothers, the Protestants, do you realize the Catholics have more miracles than we do. This is the greatest miracle worker among the Pentecostals in the world today. He has healing services and people healed everywhere. He says those Catholics have more miracles than we do. He actually said that publicly. And he says the reason I think, he told them, is because of Holy Communion. He's a Protestant pastor. Would you give me a break? Look what God is doing. You see what God is doing? He's bringing them back in. 30,000 Protestant and Pentecostal ministers have become Roman Catholic in the last 20 years. 30,000. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So he told them Holy Communion, I believe, he says, is their secret. He says, they really believe, he said. They, they really believe. That's you, you see? So I love the Holy Spirit. I really am a man of the Holy Spirit. I imagine if Biddy Hit and I met, we both would knock down and drop out unconscious. We met each other from the Holy Spirit, from each other. You see what I mean? I love the Holy Spirit. And, you know, my grandmother, Sinchette, my mother's mother, she was a wild, crazy charismatic. She started the first charismatic prayer meeting in all of the state of Florida in her living room with the permission of her pastor. It was the first one in the state of Florida. I didn't know that, but I would go to sleep with my grandmother at her house I would sleep on the couch, not knowing that's where the Holy Spirit first fell down in Florida. I didn't know that. I was just a little boy. I loved to be with her because she was so funny, you know? And we'd have a great time together. She and I would walk for miles together and go to the store and get a donut and keep walking. I just loved her. In her living room was where the, Holy, the first Holy Spirit charismatic prayer meeting in the state of Florida. Amen. That's why I'm so crazy, you see? I love the Holy Spirit, and I've noticed this, the more time we spend in adoration, you and I, in adoration and mass, and the more time we pray the rosary, the more filled we are with the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest source of the Holy Spirit today, and that's why the Protestants are going to come back in. They'll begin to realize, those Catholics, they got it, the Eucharist and the Virgin Mary. Amen? So. I want to share with you a quick little story. When my mom was still on this world, I came home once to visit her as a young priest, and I had you know, some time off in Central America. And my mama, I was there for a few weeks, and mama said, Jim, would you take me to go visit Mrs. Quigley? I said, sure, mom. 
So she really, she didn't drive at that point, so I would drive her around. So we went to visit my mother's best friend, Mrs. Quigley. She was an Irish woman, of course, and of course my mother was Italian, so they were best friends. My mom had eight children, I'm one of eight, and Mrs. Quigley had 12 children. She beat my mom. <laughs> she had 12. And they were, you know, good, really beautiful friends. And of course, Mrs. Quigley's children were friends with us, with me and my generation, our kids. We had pretty good friendships there. So now, Mrs. Quigley is in her 90s, an old, tough Irish Catholic woman. And my mother went to visit her moms in her, in her 80s, and we had quite the visit. What a beautiful visit we had. And at the end of the visit, it became clear to me that Mrs. Quigley is getting ready for heaven. She's not afraid. See, a real Catholic's not afraid. But this woman, she knows what's going down, you see? And she's in her 90s, and she knows this is probably her last visit with Maria, my mom. So at the end, it wasn't morbid at all. At the end of the visit, Mrs. Quigley got up and said, now, Maria and Father Jim, she's always very polite, but Maria and Father Jim, come into the next room. I have a gift for you. So we followed Mrs. Quigley into the next room. She lived like, in a, like a condominium, a, very, a beautiful place, an extra room there, like a sitting room. We went in there, and she opened a drawer. She said, I have something special for you. She took out this big, flat, white box, a big, flat, skinny, white box, took it out, and then she took the cover off of it. And when she did, there were in this box compartments, and there were at least 50 first-class relics. She was the widow of a colonel, Colonel Quigley, who also was a friend of mine before he died, a great, a great soldier and a great man of God, charismatic as well. So every year, Mr. and Mrs. Quigley went to the Vatican every year. That was their only vacation, and they would give a donation to the Pope every year to support his work, and he would make sure they got a relic every year. She had literally 50 first-class relics there. And she said to my mother and I, now, Maria and Father Jim, choose one and take it home. It's like her parting gift to us. Isn't that touching? It's like a, a goodbye gift to us. So my mother looked, and my mother chose one. And I looked at them, and so look at all 50. True story, I see a laser beam, a laser light come out of one of them. <sighs> a light. There's 50, now there's 49 because my mom took one, but there's a light coming out of one of them. I thought, well, I guess that's the one I'm supposed to take, isn't it? <laughs> what would you do? You see what I mean? God speaks pretty simply, doesn't he? Pretty clear. There's one laser light, only one whew, coming out. So I picked it up and took that one, and it said St. Camillus. He was a priest like me. He was a military veteran like me. He had a healing ministry like I did. He was a priest, a military veteran with a healing ministry. And his feast day had just been changed to my birthday. <laughs> July the 18th. Had just been changed to July, my birthday. That was the one that was shining. As we thanked her, it was simply incredible. But, you know, when you walk with Jesus, you almost get used to this. These things happen all the time. How does the song go? Great things happen when God mixes with man. Great things happen when God mixes with man. Amen? Amen. You'll receive abundant miracles if you make Jesus your everything. Don't make him only part of your life. Don't make him half. Make him everything. I'm speaking to the church right now. I'm being anointed. Don't make him part of your life. That is idolatry. That's sinful. Don't make him part of your life. No, 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 no. Tacos are part of your life. God is everything. Amen? Make God your everything. Fall in love with God more than you'd fall in love with the most beautiful woman in the world. More than that, make God your everything. Amen? Amen. Would you try it now? Raise your right hand to God, please, the Holy Trinity. Say this with God, I love you. God, I love you. Beginning now, Beginning you, now. Are you are my everything. I love you with all my heart. I give you all my life. I give you my eternity. I want only you. 
from now on, you alone. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Mary. Amen. Thanks be to God. We're Catholic now. We can go home. We just did it, amen? But to finish the story, you thought it was done, didn't you? I looked back at the box, and there was a host in one of the compartments. A host, a Eucharist, which, as you know, is forbidden. Can't do that. It's forbidden. I saw it afterwards, a host. That's against the law, you know? You can't, it's, it's lack of respect. That's God. And I looked, and I looked at Mrs. Quigley, and I did not have the heart to say it out loud, because that that's forbidden. But I'm a Catholic priest, which means I have a responsibility to protect the Eucharist, if necessary, with my blood. If, I will. If necessary, with my blood, with my death. I knew I had to get that host. I couldn't stay there. It's my job. I have to, anywhere in the world. And so I was thinking, Mrs. Quigley, she's a holy woman. She really is. She wouldn't do that. But she's starting to lose her faculties a little bit. You know, you could tell a little bit. All I could think of was maybe that the minister came there to her condominium. They, they bring her Holy Communion every day. That maybe... One of them came and dropped a host. It happens now and then. And Mrs. Quigley saw the host, picked it up, and put it with the relics, not knowing what to do, and would tell the priest when he would come, but forgot about it, you see? It may have been sitting there for years. I know this woman. She would never do that on purpose. I felt like St. Joseph when he found that Mother Mary was with child. He knew Mary was not an adulteress. It's impossible. How could there be a baby in her womb? But she would never do anything wrong. He was totally confused. He decided to divorce her quietly, right? So I saw this. I knew Mom, Miss Quigley would never do this. I don't know why it's there. Some mistake. I couldn't bear to embarrass her or my mother, embarrass her in front of my mother. And so I did what every good Italian boy does. You know what I did? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I went like this. Look, Mom. Literally. And Mrs. Quigley and Mom were over here. They went, they went. And when they did, I grabbed the host. <laughs> and then they turned back around and said, what? I said, oh, you didn't see it? Because <laughs> my job is to protect the Eucharist, you see? So I swallowed the host. I had to. But I didn't want to do it to embarrass anyone, you see? I know she didn't do it on purpose. So I took it to myself. We said goodbye, we got in the car. It gets really emotional now. My mouth filled up with blood. I didn't bite anything. My mouth, the moment I took the host, I tasted human flesh. The moment I took it, but I couldn't show them what was happening. It was flesh, human flesh. I didn't tell them. On the way home, my mouth filled with blood. And I had to swallow it. I didn't have any purificators with me. So I wanted to reach my finger in to show my mom, but I couldn't, just, I couldn't do it respectfully because I had no purificator to clean my finger. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. I can't play with it. I wanted to show my mom. I wanted to see myself, the blood. But there's no way to do that with not, not the proper linens with me. So I had to swallow three times on the way home. And my mom, she said to me, she didn't know what was happening. She said, now, Jim, yes, mom, what were you doing there? I know you were fooling me. What were you doing? <laughs> you can't fool your mom, you know what I mean? So then I had to tell her what happened about the host, and I swallowed it. I said, mom, she said, yes. Mom, that was Jesus. Mom, there's blood in my mouth. It's Jesus. So let's say that holy prayer right now from Nigeria, from Barnabas in Nigeria. The prayer to the blood of Jesus. We'll finish with that for your healing. 
It's the prayer to the blood of Jesus. And when you say it, the presence of the Eucharist and the Holy Spirit comes down over us immediately. It brings the Mass and Calvary and the Eucharist into you when you say this prayer anywhere in the world. And if somehow, for some reason, you can't get to the church in the near future, if you know what I'm trying to say, if things shut down again, and they will, you say this prayer and God will fill you with the Holy Eucharist, with this prayer. I promise you, we've experienced it ourselves. It's only one line, and this is, this is a second miracle prayer. This is the one that heals drug addicts. This one that heals depression, it heals suicide. I bet you it will heal transgenderism as well. I bet this prayer will heal that as well. Only 12 words given to a teenager in Africa, in Father Joseph's homeland, given to a teenager named Barnabas who's now in the seminary. It has the imprimatur. It's only one line. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us. We're going to keep going for your healing. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. Beloved, we're going to ask Father to place our Lord and Savior on the altar. That Eucharist is the source of the Holy Spirit that you want inside of you. We're going to continue saying this prayer in his divine presence to call forth that blood inside of us. Amen. Anything demonic that's bothering you, and there is such a thing as a spirit of infirmity. I see some right now. The Lord shows me what's with us. I see, ooh, baby, I get the anointing too strong now. He's going to get rid of those. I was in an Indian reservation. The woman was, came with her hands gnarled with arthritis. I was asked to pray over this holy American Indian woman, terrible arthritis, gnarled, just like the Bible, the scripture verse. She came to see me, and she said, Father, can you heal me? I said, well, I'll try. I can pray over you. And I touched her gnarled hands, and I moved my hand back. I said, you don't have arthritis, Mom. You have a spirit of infirmity. You have a demon. She's an American Indian. They know this stuff. They know it. I says, you have a curse on you. Will you let me break the curse? Yes, Father. They weren't, she wasn't afraid at all. I put my fingers back, but I didn't pray for healing. I put my fingers back on her gnarled hand and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave now. Her hand popped right open. And the other hand here was gnarled, opened up. She was healed of five years of crippling rheumatoid arthritis in five seconds. The demon left her. There is such a thing as a demon of sickness. Isn't it true, Father? We see it a lot, actually. And the more there's new age and witchcraft in an area, the more there'll be spirits of sickness. So we're going to get a lot of healing tonight, you see, because a lot of your sickness is caused by the demonic realm. Some of it is natural on the natural level. We're going to pray for that healing as well. The blood of Jesus is all-powerful. It's not my blood. My blood is human. His blood is divine. His blood is spotless and all-powerful. One drop of his blood could save the world. One drop. So we're going to ask the Lord through his blood to heal every demonic illness and every natural illness as well. Amen? Amen. The Lord says, Jim, don't forget this. He tells me psychiatric illness. He's speaking to me right now. So any psychiatric illness that might be here, let's say, for instance, paranoia. Like you have too much fear, paranoia. Schizo I've seen schizophrenia healed instantly. Schizophrenia, especially depression. That seems to be universal now, the healing of depression as well. I cannot heal you. I wish I could. I can barely make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich correctly. <laughs> but God can heal you. Amen? Oh, and I feel him right now. Mama mia, I feel him. Not me. I'm nothing. He's everything right? I'm nothing. He's everything. But I feel God all over me right now. 
we'll ask him to heal you. Right, Father? We can't do it, but we're brothers. We're going to ask God to heal you. Ooh, baby, just keep you anointed too strong. Everyone here to receive some sort of healing. The Lord, again, is speaking to me. He says, I tell you, we need to pray for your joy. That's a healing. No more sad-faced Catholics. Amen? Amen? To me, that's the worst sickness of them all. You might be six foot six, 300 pounds, an NFL linebacker, all the money in the world, but if you're sad, you're good for nothing. Isn't it true? We need joy. Joy is the fullness of the presence of God. If you have joy, you can endure anything. And I pray that you and I one day will die with a smile on our face. Amen? Amen. I've seen that before, haven't you, Father? Oh, my gosh. You see a holy Catholic person die with a smile? May everyone here have the smile of Jesus or Mary beginning tonight. That, I think, in a certain way, is the most important healing. Amen?